All right, hello everybody and welcome to the SETI Institute Colloquium. We don't have the usual movie star MC today, so I'm substituting. Um, I'd like to introduce Tyler Robinson. He's gonna be talking about uh, brown dwarf variability and its implications for exoplanet habitability, or for exoplanets in general. Um, Tyler got his bachelor's degree from the University of Arizona and his PhD from University of Washington, where he studied um, all, all kinds of habitability of exoplanets. He's done modeling um, and observations of exoplanets and how we might detect habitable planets out there by looking at the planets in our own solar system, including the Earth, and seeing what they might look like from afar. Um, so today I think he's gonna talk more about the brown dwarf end, um, where he's been doing lately, which is modeling, atmospheric modeling of brown dwarfs. Um, and I will just let Tyler start right away. Welcome. Thanks, Doug. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Ty Robinson. I'm a MPP fellow at NASA Ames, so just around the corner here. Uh, and so I'm working with Mark Marley, who's here. He's in, he's in the back. He's my uh, advisor. And so a lot of these tools that I've been using uh, and a lot of the models that you'll see showing up kind of towards the end are, are things that he spent a, a career developing. So I, I definitely owe a, a thanks to, to him. Um, so where I want to start, actually, is with this amazing looking structure, uh, which is in the constellation Ophiuchus. And so this is the Rho Ophiuchi. Um, uh, 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 cloud forming com or star formation complex. It's a molecular cloud is, is what this is. Um, and so this is a false color image uh, taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope, uh, which looks at infrared wavelengths and which allows you to peer through all of the dust and muck that occurs in star forming regions in the molecular clouds to see through to uh, uh, light sources that are inside of the cloud. So you can see these little reddish things in there. Um, and so each of those sources is actually a star that is in the process of forming right now uh, as we speak. Uh, and so uh, current counts put the number of forming stars in this cloud upwards of several hundred to 400 things that are forming inside of this cloud. Uh, and by studying those objects that are in the process of forming, we know that uh, the, this cloud complex has been undergoing star formation for about 100,000 years to a million years, which sounds really long, but on galactic time scales, that's actually uh, essentially just yesterday. Um, but those timescales are long compared to, say, human lifetime, which means we have to turn to models and simulations uh, if we kind of want to watch the process of star formation unfold. Um, and so these are, these are hydrodynamical simulations from uh, uh, Matthew Bate um, that show on the, on the left is uh, density, column density of material, and then on the right is temperature uh, in 3D simulations of, of star formation. Uh, and so what we know from simulations like these, as well as a wealth of studies of uh, star forming regions in the galaxy, uh, is that star formation leads to uh, the formation uh, or the birth of a very wide range of masses of objects. And so I'm actually going to take us, so you can actually see you know, different size things that are occurring in, in, in these simulations. But what I'm going to do is take us back to uh, Rho Ophiuchi. Um, as soon as the simulation stops, there we go. Uh, and so this is actually data from a region in that star forming uh, uh, cloud um, showing uh, on the, on the y-axis here, so the vertical axis is the log of the number. So this would be 10 and this would be uh, 100. And then on the x-axis here uh, is the mass of the thing that is, that is forming. So this would be something that is 10 times the mass of the sun, uh, of our sun. This would be something that is the mass of the sun. And this would be something that is 1 tenth the mass of the sun. So this is just a count. In, in mass bins of the stuff that's forming inside of uh, Rho Ophiuchi. Um, and so what you see is uh, at the high end of the mass scale, so stuff that is more massive uh, than, than the sun. So the B stars, the A stars, and the F stars are what will become B, A, and F stars. Um, there are relatively few of, of those kinds of stars forming. Uh, and then as you head to lower mass things, the G type uh, stars, which is what our sun is, down to the K stars and the M stars, uh, you see that there are a wealth of, of those objects forming. Um, and so actually, the most prevalent thing that gets formed as a result of, of star formation are actually stars that are less massive than the sun. These are M dwarfs. Um, and so M dwarfs actually extend down to about 8% the mass of the sun, or 80 times the mass of Jupiter, um, which is kind of what this bar is right here. But what I want you to notice uh, is that uh, the universe doesn't really care so much about uh, the weird nomenclature and the bins that we place on how we divide up stars. Uh, and the universe continues to form stuff right on down past uh, what we would call M dwarfs. And so you can see that there is still stuff forming uh, down here at, at lower masses. And so what that stuff is, is it's the realm of the brown dwarves. And so here's 
uh, uh, schematic where sizes are to scale uh, of, of bona fide stars like the sun uh, and like this star here, Gliese 229, which is a, uh, a higher mass M dwarf, um, down into the brown dwarfs, uh, which kind of fill in the regime between uh, the M dwarfs and uh, things that we would recognize as planets like Jupiter. And so uh, brown dwarfs actually span a really wide range of temperatures. Uh, and so at the highest temperatures, we have a category of brown dwarfs called the L dwarfs. Uh, and so those span about 1,300 Kelvin to 2,000 Kelvin. Uh, and so they are, they are hot by our standards, but by stellar standards, quite cool. Um, at lower temperatures than the L dwarfs, we then have a category of brown dwarfs called the T dwarfs uh, that span about 700 Kelvin to 1,300 Kelvin. Uh, and then only very recently, we now have observational evidence for uh, a new class of brown dwarfs that are even cooler than the T dwarfs, which are called Y dwarfs, uh, that are temperatures below 700 Kelvin. Uh, and so again, by stellar standards or by star standards, these are very, uh, very cool uh, temperatures. Okay, so you're going to hear L dwarfs and T dwarfs throughout this presentation. And so I just kind of wanted to put it in perspective uh, and remember that L dwarfs are things that are, that are uh, cooler than M dwarfs. And we're talking about 1300 to 2000 Kelvin. T dwarfs, we're talking 700 to 1300 Kelvin. Uh, and the other thing that I want to point out on this slide uh, is that, again, the sizes are to scale. And so I want you to note that for the brown dwarfs, uh, even though their masses span from about a Jupiter mass up to about 80 Jupiter masses, uh, their sizes are all about the same. So they're all about a Jupiter radii. Uh, and so they're all about the same size as Jupiter. So when you picture these things in your mind, picture something that's cool, uh, it's glowing deep red, uh, about the size of Jupiter, um, uh, 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 spanning a, a range of temperatures from something like Jupiter up to a couple thousand Kelvin. So with that, with that picture in mind, now I want to I wanna return to uh, the Roofuyuki cloud complex. Uh, and this is from a press release where uh, some authors uh, searched through the cloud complex for things that are brown dwarf-ish uh, in their, in their uh, mass. Uh, and so all of the little circles that you see here are brown dwarfs or things that will become brown dwarfs detected uh, in the Roofuyuki cloud complex. And you see if you count them, there's kind of several tens of them in that, in that image. Uh, and so what we know from studies like this is that uh, when our galaxy goes about forming stars, that it forms about one brown dwarf for every five stars. Uh, and so that means that there's actually lots and lots and lots of, of brown dwarfs out there. But what makes a brown dwarf different from a star? Uh, and so to that, I actually want to turn to um, some, some schematics. Uh, and so what I'm going to show you here, it's kind of a cartoon of the temperature at the inside of, say, a star or uh, a brown dwarf um, as it's in the process of forming. And then running along the x-axis down here is time. So at the furthest left, we're talking a time scale of, of uh, a million years, which is picking up kind of where Rho, Rho Ophiuchi is right now, uh, and then extending up to 100 million years and then 10, 10 billion years all the way over at the, at the far right. Now, uh, for an M dwarf, a bona fide star, um, you start off relatively cool uh, in your core. Uh, and then as the exterior of the star radiates to space and cools, you undergo Kelvin-Helmholtz contraction, uh, which means that the core actually heats up. Uh, and eventually, the core gets hot enough that uh, hydrogen fusion ignites. And then your core temperature stabilizes, and you become a star. Um, now, let's contrast that to brown dwarves, which are the little engines that couldn't. Um, and so because they are lower mass than the M dwarfs, uh, they start off slightly cooler uh, on this track. Uh, and they also undergo Kelvin-Helmholtz contraction. Uh, but they never quite get hot enough inside of their core to ignite core hydrogen fusion, um, which means that then they are fated to uh, cool over the course of tens of billions of years. So they just get cooler and cooler and cooler, or fainter and fainter and fainter. OK, so that's what's going on in the cores of these objects. And this is what distinguishes a star that's doing core hydrogen fusion from uh, a brown dwarf. Um, something else that's interesting and needs to be pointed out is now let's move to the outside of the star. So we're going to talk about the effective temperature, so the temperature of the outside of the star, essentially. Uh, and so here's that, that same M dwarf track. Uh, starting off young, it starts off hot, and then it cools. Uh, and then eventually, hydrogen fusion in its core ignites, and it stabilizes with regards to its effective temperature. And the amazing thing about M dwarfs is then that they glow with that effective temperature for tens to 100 billion years. So they're, they're amazing little furnaces. Um, 
Contrast that to what I'll call a high mass brown dwarf. So let's say that this is something that's like 60 or 70 times the mass of, of Jupiter. Um, it, like we just discussed on the previous slide, doesn't get to do core hydrogen fusion, so it just cools over time, which is what I'm showing you here. Uh, and then I'm going to throw up also what is a, a low mass brown dwarf. So let's say this is something like 10 times the mass of Jupiter. Uh, it does the same thing, doesn't do core hydrogen fusion, just cools over time. But here we see uh, something that makes brown dwarfs a little tricky. Uh, which is that if you observe a brown dwarf and say you measure its effective temperature, so you have a data point here on this, on this y-axis, um, and you draw a line over to the, to the right from that, if you have no other information, you don't know if that brown dwarf that you have observed is just a young, low-mass object that's still hot with this residual energy of formation, or uh, if that object is actually a higher-mass brown dwarf that's older and so has cooled over time. Uh, and so it takes actually extra information, say, about the gravity, surface gravity of that object to, to break that degeneracy. OK, so that's how brown dwarves are distinguished from stars. Um, so now I want to talk with you a little bit about why they're cool in kind of a colloquial sense. Um, so I've, I've just convinced you that brown dwarves are, are cool in a temperature sense. And so to put it in perspective, um, I'm showing you here temperatures as you head down into uh, the atmospheres and interiors of, a different, of different kinds of worlds. Uh, and so this up here would be, the, say, the top of the atmosphere, and then this is headed down in. Uh, so here's uh, the sun, uh, which has an effective temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin, so it's hot. Uh, moving down the temperature scale, you get to the M dwarves, which have effective temperatures in the ballpark of several thousand Kelvin. Uh, and then the L dwarves are shown here. This is characteristic 1,800 Kelvin, and then down to the T dwarf, which is 1,000 Kelvin. Uh, and then the Y doors would fill in the space in here, and then you'd have something with Jupiter even further down. Um, point being is that the L dwarfs and the T dwarfs and the Y dwarfs, that spectral sequence is actually a temperature sequence. Uh, and so I want you to keep in mind that when I'm talking about L dwarfs, T dwarfs, uh, and a little bit that I might say about Y dwarfs is I'm really talking about things that are hotter, cool, and, and cooler. Um, and so the Interesting thing that starts to happen in atmospheres as you allow them to cool uh, is that uh, molecules start to form. And so what I'm going to show you here are actually spectra of uh, brown dwarfs and actually some of the lowest mass M dwarfs. Uh, and so on the, the y-axis is just brightness. Uh, and the spectra that I'm about to show you have all been offset from, from one another for, for clarity. Uh, and then on the x-axis here is the wavelength that we're, that we're looking at. And so those wavelengths are in the near infrared. And so we go to the near infrared to look at brown dwarves uh, because uh, their effective temperatures are in the regime where most of their light is coming out uh, at near infrared wavelengths. And so that's the best place to go to, to detect their light. So what I'm showing you here are, so here are the, the lowest mass M dwarfs. So this is an M6 dwarf and this is an M8 dwarf. Uh, and then you transition into the brown dwarfs. So here are some L dwarfs down here, again, all offset from one another. And so in the atmospheres of M dwarfs, um, you can see the wiggles here, and you can see the wiggles here. Uh, the temperature conditions are right, such that hydrogen and oxygen can finally come together and form stable water vapor molecules. Um, and so you, you kind of have to squint to see those. Uh, but as you head down into the L dwarfs, which are, again, cooler and cooler, uh, you see that you get these very deep bands of uh, water vapor absorption. And I think that that's really amazing that a, a molecule that's so common in our atmosphere here on Earth is also uh, prevalent. Uh, in the atmospheres of, of, of these uh, strange kinds of worlds. And then adding the T dwarfs to the picture. So what I've done to you now is that plot that I just showed you got moved over to the left. And now over here, we're looking at the end of the L dwarf sequence and then down into the T dwarf sequence. Uh, we see that the water vapor bands still stay very strong. But the other thing that you see creeping in, uh, say focus on this region right here uh, as you head down, is you start to get methane that forms in these atmospheres, CH4. Uh, and so uh, the thermal conditions in the T dwarf atmospheres are appropriate for methane to be stable there. Uh, and that's actually characteristic of the, of the T dwarfs is that you see uh, methane absorption bands in their atmospheres. Can you just for a second note what the temperatures are once again? Yes. So the, the, the L dwarfs will span, uh, so this is about 2,000 Kelvin uh, down to about 1,300 Kelvin, and then 1,300 Kelvin uh, down to about 700 Kelvin. So, the other thing that happens uh, as a result of things getting cooler, and, and we have experience with this here on our planet, uh, is that if you take a gas and you cool it, uh, and you have volatiles in that gas, uh, eventually they condense out to form condensates. Uh, 
Um, and so I think what is really astounding about the atmospheres of, of the brown dwarfs is that indeed they do have condensates in them, but they are very otherworldly kinds of condensates. So there are clouds in these atmospheres, but not clouds like anything you and I would, would really uh, recognize. So in the portions of the atmosphere that we can best probe for, for Eldors with, with observations, uh, we know that forming in those atmospheres are clouds of magnesium silicates, so things like rocks condense out, uh, and also uh, liquid iron will, uh, will condense out. So there will be iron clouds there too, uh, which is just amazing. Um, if you move to the T-dwarfs, which are again cooler, so deeper in their atmosphere, those same clouds form because you have to go deeper into the atmosphere to get to the same kinds of appropriate temperatures for uh, the, the, the rock and the iron clouds. Uh, but higher up in these atmospheres, the, the conditions are appropriate for essentially things that look like salt clouds forming. Uh, so something like, say, potassium chloride that, um, that is uh, indicated there. Um, and so that then leads to uh, the kind of crazy cool uh, artist uh, concepts of what the atmospheres of, of brown dwarfs may, may look like, um, where you have, say, clouds over some hot roiling surface down here, uh, and these clouds are raining out, say, uh, salts or iron or something like that, and then some, some, some liberties were taken maybe with the lightning, but of course maybe there could be lightning in, in these atmospheres. Um, so clouds form these atmospheres. Now, um, we know from looking at solar system worlds that when you have clouds, uh, you, have, um, you have a variation of brightnesses across the, the surface of, of that world. And so what I'm showing you here is, is Jupiter. And so over uh, on the left is Jupiter in reflected light. Uh, and you can see this deep red band right here that when you go to longer wavelengths where you're now looking at Jupiter in the light that it is emitting, this is not reflected light anymore, um, that, that band is actually a, a place where you get to see relatively deep down into the atmosphere. And so you see the band pops out here too. And because you get to see deep down into the atmosphere, you're seeing down to where the temperatures are warmer. Uh, and so that band glows brightly. Uh, and it also grows, uh, uh, glows brightly over here at, at, at even longer wavelengths. Um, and so then you could imagine that, uh, say, as Jupiter's bands come and go over long time scales, or even over the time scale of a rotation of Jupiter, which is 10 hours, uh, if you have different cloud features over the, over the, the surface of, of Jupiter, um, that if you're watching its brightness as it rotates, you're going to see variation in its brightness that comes from there being cloud structures uh, on Jupiter. Um, and so the thing that I want you to remember, and, and I'll highlight this in a, in a second, uh, is that when we're talking about brown dwarfs, uh, we're not talking about looking at these things in reflected light. So we are talking about brown dwarf emitting its own, its own radiation. And so the, the better model for thinking about brown dwarfs are these images over here on the right, where you're looking at Jupiter uh, in its own emitted light. Um, so Doug said that uh, my background is actually in, in the pale blue dot. And so I actually want to take just a moment and tie this discussion of variability into uh, the world that we call home, uh, terrestrial with a, with a capital T. Um, and so, let's see, seven years ago now? So in, in 2008, NASA repurposed the Deep Impact spacecraft. Uh, and so one of the things that they had it do was on several occasions, it turned around and it took data for our planet, the pale blue dot. Um, so we happened on one of those occasions to catch a transit of the, of the moon across the Earth's disk. Um, and so on those three occasions, we got light curves. So that is measurements of brightness as a function of, of time. Uh, and we stared for a full 24 hours, so we got a full rotation of the planet uh, underneath, the, underneath the spacecraft. Uh, and so I want to show you some of, uh, some of these light curves. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is normalized brightness is what is on the, the y-axis. Um, as a function of time. So the observations start here uh, and then proceed over the course of 24 hours. But because the planet is rotating underneath you or underneath the spacecraft from, from this perspective, um, again, the observations start here. And then what that means is that the west longitude is increasing with time. Uh, so, so time and longitude are, are synonymous there. Um, and so each of the different colors here was a different band that uh, the, uh, the Deep Impact spacecraft had on board for, for making these observations. These are broadband filters. They're 100 nanometers wide, so they're pretty fat. Um, and so we had uh, observations at UV wavelengths, I guess near UV wavelengths, blue, green, red, redder, uh, and then kind of into the, into the near infrared there. Uh, and you see that there's actually a lot of structure 
in, in those light curves. And, and what we know from uh, modeling's observations is that most of that structure comes from cloud complexes uh, uh, in, the Earth's, in the Earth's atmosphere. And so focusing on this blue light curve that you see running through here, um, there are actually three distinct peaks. So there's a peak there, there's a peak there, and there's also a peak there. Uh, then in this case, uh, we know from comparing these observations to essentially weather maps uh, that those peaks correspond to uh, thick, bright clouds that were forming near the Earth's equator um, and had actually punched high up into the atmosphere, so they're also quite cool. Um, and so what we can do now is look at the Earth in infrared wavelengths. So this is in reflected light, which I said isn't a particularly good model for brown dwarfs because brown dwarfs were looking at them in their thermal emission. Uh, but it, the uh, epoxy mission uh, that reused the deep impact spacecraft also had measured thermal light from, from the Earth. And so here's that exact same uh, blue light uh, light curve that I just showed you, again, with the one, two, three peaks. And this black line now is Earth at longer wavelengths where it's dominated primarily by emitted light. Uh, and you see that those peaks in that light curve actually correspond to troughs in the uh, emitted light. And that's because, like I said, that those clouds were cold, and cold things aren't very good emitters. Uh, and so you actually have a deficit of light emitted from the Earth when you have something cold, like a cold cloud in view. Um, and so actually, in the Earth's thermal light curve, uh, it achieves its peak uh, here, at where zero is in west longitude, which is actually when the Sahara rotates into view, is when Earth appeared uh, brightest in, its, in, in those infrared wavelengths. So all of this is just to orient you with, um, uh, with regards to your thinking that you're, you're probably used to thinking of clouds as being bright. And so if you see a light curve uh, that, that uh, indicates that something is, uh, that a brown dwarf is dark, you would, you would, it's counterintuitive to think that that is, that that is actually, that's where the cloud is. But when you're looking at something in, in thermal light, uh, clouds prevent you from seeing the deep, hot parts of the atmosphere. So it's actually, the light curves are low uh, when you happen to have, say, lots of cloud in them. So that's, that's the, the counterintuitive bit that I want you to, to tuck away uh, for, for the, the rest of uh, the presentation. OK, so that was the terrestrial perspective and actually came from uh, some of my dissertation work at the University of Washington. OK, um, so the first brown dwarf was, the, I guess the first unequivocal brown dwarf was announced in 1995 uh, within about a week of the first uh, exoplanet bona fide uh, exoplanet also being announced, which was a, a hot Jupiter. Um, so brown dwarfs and exoplanets have had uh, a very similar trajectory with regards to, to study, uh, and lots of kind of uh, fruitful exchange between, between the two fields. Um, so shortly after 1995, uh, it was already clear that these worlds probably had clouds in their atmosphere. And so it wasn't too far-fetched to then think about taking observations that would hunt for variability in the light curves of these things that would indicate that clouds are, say, coming and going in their atmospheres, or that you have a patchy surface where there are some thick clouds and some thin clouds, and as that brown dwarf rotates, uh, it appears dimmer and brighter at, at different times. Uh, and so a lot of people tried for this. And again, I told you the first uh, brown dwarf was 95. So then in 99 uh, was, was kind of a, a first attempt um, that, that claimed a, a detection of, of variability by Tinian trolley. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is uh, essentially, you can think about this as being brightness uh, variations on the y-axis, and then this is time over the course of about two hours uh, on the x-axis. And so in the background here is a comparison star that should have been non-variable. Um, and you can see that it actually has pretty large error bars, and it looks pretty messy. But it is consistent with roughly uh, a straight line. Uh, and then these thick data points here that have smaller error bars uh, is, a, is an object that's kind of bounding the M to L transition, so it's not entirely clear if it's, uh, say, a, a very, very low mass M dwarf or, or an L dwarf. Um, and so you can see that over the course of the observations that it does appear to, to brighten. Um, but this really wasn't the um, hole in one that everyone was kind of hoping for, especially since what you would like to see is you'd like to see it, say, uh, if this is, say, a, a cloud that's causing it to appear darker. Um, you'd like to see it return over a full cycle, over a full rotation to, uh, to this same point that would indicate that you'd actually just observed a full rotation of, of the object. Um, and so the fact that you're just seeing something brightening here um, isn't, isn't super convincing. Uh, and also shortly thereafter, uh, Nakajima et al. Um, 
published some results for a much cooler object. Uh, so this is something that's in the mid T dwarf range. So this is around 1,000 Kelvin. Um, and so here they're showing you brightness on this axis as a function of wavelength. So now we have spectra. Uh, so this is again in the near infrared, which is where we look for, for, for brown dwarfs. Uh, and so as you head off to the left here, the reason why brightness is decreasing is you're heading into a water vapor absorption feature. Um, and so you have two different spectra uh, on this curve. Uh, and you might look at that and say, oh, well, they definitely observe variability. Look, it's much brighter in these observations than it is in this one. Um, but they've kind of tricked you in that they've intentionally offset these two. If you did overplot them without removing this plus a constant here, um, they would sit right on top of one another. Uh, and so the argument uh, in, in this paper was that actually some of these features do appear to look slightly different from one observation to the next. Um, but again, it's not entirely clear if that's noise. Uh, and so it, it wasn't, uh, again, super convincing. Um, so it took almost a decade for someone to finally knock it out of the park. Uh, and so this was the observation that finally knocked it out of the park. This was an observation by Artigal uh, et al. in 2009 uh, of an early T dwarf. Um, and so this is, again, looking in the, in the near infrared. This is a big, fat, broad filter uh, spanning 0.3 microns or 300 nanometers from 1.1 to 1.4 microns. And so that bounds a couple of water vapor bands. Um, and so this is normalized brightness on, on the y-axis. And so this is the T dwarf up here. And then this is a comparison star down here that should be non-variable. Uh, and so this was a ground-based observation. Uh, and so there are air mass effects, which means that at different times in the observation, you're looking through different columns of air. So that the, uh, if you look at the comparison star, it actually appears slightly brighter uh, here than it did over here. And that's just an atmospheric effect because you're doing ground-based observing. Uh, but if you look at the brown dwarf, superimposed on, on top of that is what is very clearly uh, variability. Um, and so if you look at the scale of that variability, it's kind of peaked to trough about 10%, which from studies of Jupiter is pretty consistent with what you would expect, at least given Jupiter. The numbers that I showed you for Earth peaked to trough were 10 to 20%. Um, so it's not like this is uh, out of line with what you might expect for thermal variability. Uh, but then the other neat thing that you can do with these observations, because they kind of repeat, is you can, pull out, um, you can pull out a rotation period. And so this guy is rotating in about two and a half hours, uh, which is really surprising. So, Jupiter, so this is something the size of Jupiter. Jupiter rotates in, in 10 hours. Uh, and so this is rotating four times faster than, than Jupiter does. Um, but the other thing that you can see here is that uh, the light curve does not repeat perfectly. And so that is evidence for, say, maybe cloud features evolving uh, on this world. Or uh, another way to put that is that maybe this is evidence for weather uh, occurring, occurring on this world. Um, Artie Gaudal had observations over the course of actually multiple nights. Uh, and so here, um, spanning about five separate nights, they have observations of, of that same object, where the light curve actually shows a great deal of uh, complexity, um, enough complexity that we, we certainly haven't been able to, to disentangle it yet. But it seems like that this is something, this is probably weather happening on this planet. Um, which, is, which is quite amazing. OK. Um, so that was in 2009. And since then, brown dwarf variability studies have uh, kind of exploded. Um, and so uh, what I want to show you now are actually some really notable and exciting cases of, of weird things that brown dwarfs have done while we've been watching them. Who knows what they've done when we haven't been watching them. Um, so this was a study published by uh, Jackie Radigan just a few years ago. Um, of, a, of an early T dwarf, so a T1.5 dwarf. So this is, again, kind of near that, that bounding temperature for the T dwarfs, 1300 Kelvin. Um, so these were observations taken over the course of several nights. Uh, this is ground-based. Uh, and these were, some of these are actually different wavelengths. So this is a, a broad filter at 1.2 microns. This is a broad filter at 2.2 microns, back to 1.2, and then at 1.6. So these are all slightly different wavelengths. But what I really want to draw your attention to is this first night's worth of observations. Um, so here we have normalized brightness on this axis, and then this is time and hours on this axis. And so you see that after the observations start, the brown dwarf achieves some maximum brightness and then starts to drop off pretty steeply. Uh, and that when the observations end, it still hasn't actually achieved its minimum brightness. Uh, but the range in brightnesses that, we, that, that Jackie did manage to capture there uh, was actually peaked to trough about 30%. Uh, so that's a huge amount of, of variability. Uh, and it's likely uh, more than that because, again, they didn't, they didn't capture the, the, the trough of, of, of that uh, decrease in, in variability. And so I, this is currently the, the record holder from the most amount of variability that's been seen in, in, in a brown dwarf. Um, and then a very, a very 
a, a different case that I think is just as interesting, just as intriguing. So this is a, a mid-T dwarf. So again, we're talking about 1,000 Kelvin here. Um, these are observations from HST, uh, which helps because then you, you don't have to peer through the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and so these, are, again, are light curves. So brightness is a function of time. This is normalized brightness uh, on the y-axis. And this is time uh, normalized by the rotation period. So this guy rotates in 1.4 hours, which is even more surprising. Um, and so if you look at the top two light curves, uh, so this one spans 1.2 to 1.3 microns. This one spans 1.5 to about 1.6 microns. Um, you see that they have a peak to trough uh, variation of uh, 2 or 3 percent, uh, which isn't that much by the 30 percent standard that I, that I just showed you. Um, but if we go to this final panel down here, which is in a range of wavelengths that's centered on a water vapor absorption band, um, you see that the uh, variability is actually flipped from one another. Uh, and so when the brown dwarf was at its brightest uh, in these other two bands, uh, when you look in that water band, the brown dwarf is actually at its dimmest. Uh, and so there's actually some very complicated stuff going on here with regards to brightness variations um, not only happening, uh, brightness varying as a function of time, but also varying as a function of, of, of wavelength, um, which is very intriguing. So uh, brightness variability uh, studies, brown dwarf variability studies, uh, have actually gotten to the point where you're starting to do statistics on them. Uh, and so folks are now looking at uh, the variability of brown dwarves uh, in different bins across different spectral types. And so here's the brown dwarf uh, spectral sequence running through here, and then the corresponding kind of temperatures running up here. Um, and so each of these different uh, data points is a brown dwarf that's been studied, and he's either had or had not had variability measured. But the interesting cases are the ones that have uh, the dashed lines. And so these were observations where the brown dwarf was observed on one occasion to have large variability, say 10% in this case. Uh, and then someone came back later and made another measurement and only found an upper limit. So it didn't find any evidence for variability. So it also seems like variability is something that can turn on and turn off uh, in, in some of these worlds, um, which again is probably pointing to, to weather on these planets, maybe storms outbreaking or something like that. Um, and then in a really uh, uh, amazing result, I guess. Um, uh, Ian Crossfield, just last year, um, using um, essentially the, the Doppler technique to, to his advantage uh, and looking at the Doppler shift in, in lines uh, and splotches on the surface of a brown dwarf as that splotch rotates towards you and then away from you, um, was able to produce a map of brightness over the surface of a nearby brown dwarf. Uh, and so I'm showing you this map here. Um, so time starts here, and then as it rotates around, time is progressing uh, this way. Uh, the, the, the dark colors are where it's relatively cool on the surface of that brown dwarf, uh, and the bright colors are where it's relatively warm. Uh, and so you definitely see at least splotchiness, hot patches and cool patches uh, on the surface of, of this brown dwarf. Um, and maybe that's an argument for, uh, say, uh, cloud patterns here and, say, lack of, of cloud patterns here. It's, it's not entirely clear at this point. So um, the reason it's not entirely clear is that we're um, still kind of sorting out exactly what is causing or what could be causing the, the, the brown dwarf uh, variability. Uh, and so a few different authors have taken uh, a stab at this, uh, and we certainly don't have the final picture pieced together yet. Um, so Daniel Pye, University of Arizona, and, and his team have essentially um, taken some techniques from the, the stellar literature, uh, specifically star spot models, where you take a, a hot uh, sphere, uh, and then you paint onto it splotches that are cooler, and then you spin that thing, and you try to reproduce the light curve that you've measured for uh, a brown dwarf. Um, and so these results have shown that, uh, indeed, if you, if you paint two or three cool splotches onto a, onto a sphere and rotate it, that, that you can reproduce the light curves. Uh, and, and I guess what's, what's really worth noting is that if you look at these pictures uh, down here, which is a different which is a, a sphere that he's rotating through different angles, that that picture that they have in their mind actually looks kind of qualitatively, at least, like what we're, what we're seeing here in the, in the cross field at all observations. Um, but the, the setback to using these, these star spot models is that um, they don't actually get at the physics of what's causing uh, the hot and the cool patches. Um, they're just providing you essentially a map of where hot and cool patches might be on the, on the surface of the brown dwarf to reproduce uh, the known light curve. So it's just fitting the observations. Um, there's been only a, a few studies now of um, 
of actually the physics that could be leading to uh, variability in, in brown dwarf atmospheres. Um, so, so most recently, uh, Zhi Zhang, um, working with Adam Showman, also at the University of Arizona, did uh, some circulation models of brown dwarfs in different regimes. Uh, and so they had some free parameters, and those free parameters were things like how fast they spun that, that brown dwarf. Uh, they had a free parameter for the characteristic time scale at which they introduced uh, convective noise, essentially, and then had a free parameter for the time scale at which they allowed radiative cooling to occur. And so depending on how they set those different knobs, they could get uh, brown dwarf circulations that were in two different regimes. And so what I'm showing you here are circulations on two different kinds of brown dwarfs that they dreamt up in their, in their um, simple models. Uh, and these are temperature variations. And so these are cool patches, and these are hot patches. And so if they set the parameters in, in a certain way, they could actually get jets that occurred near the equator. Um, or if they set the parameters in some other way, they got something that just looked like a, a, a pot of boiling water. It's just a roiling surface. Um, and so then if you imagine spinning this thing and measuring its brightness as a function of time, they show that uh, you could actually get things that look like the light curves that we observe for, for brown dwarves. Uh, and that uh, as, as, say, these, uh, these uh, convective plumes come and go, or uh, as the, the jets shrink and widen, or uh, you get turbulence around those jets, um, they show that you can actually get an inter you can get additional structure in the light curves that also looks something like what we observe with, with brown dwarves. Um, these simulations don't yet include radiation. Um, so they're not actually producing a modeled spectrum of their, of their brown dwarves, uh, which means that it's kind of difficult to compare that to the brightnesses that we're actually measuring for brown dwarves. So right now, it's just kind of qualitative that they can say that if they take this sphere that has hot and cool surfaces and spin it, that they can get something that looks like hot and cool variations that have been observed for, for brown dwarves. Um, Mark and I um, took a, a slightly different tack. Um, and so we actually were using 1D simulations, where the one dimension is just the vertical through the atmosphere of, of that brown dwarf uh, to study uh, variability. Um, and so we, we picked out a, a specific case. So this was a, a mid-T dwarf. This was actually uh, the, the T dwarf that Esther Boinsley at all studied that had the, the variations uh, in brightness that occurred both as a function of wavelength and as a function of time. We thought that that observation was so intriguing that we would try to go after figuring out some way to, to model it. Um, and so we, we took some of Mark's tools uh, for simulating temperatures in the atmosphere of, of, of a brown dwarf. Uh, and what we did is we introduced a thermal perturbation deep in the atmosphere. Um, we didn't really say what would be causing that thermal perturbation. It could be a cloud. Uh, that forms and then dissipates and introduces a thermal pulse uh, into the atmosphere. And we had that thermal perturbation uh, occurring at some characteristic time scale, which is just what this tau underscore uh, p is here. So I'm just going to show you two cases of, of something that, that came out of these, these simulations. Uh, and so what I'm, this, this curve actually is, is, the, is the baseline uh, temperature profile down through the atmosphere of that brown dwarf. So that's kind of the, the standard uh, case um, before we introduce perturbations. Um, and so what this movie is actually going to show you is down through that same range of pressures through the brown dwarf atmosphere, uh, variations in temperature as a function of time, so it's going to be a movie, um, uh, and how those perturbations propagate upwards through the atmosphere. And I like watching it because it's kind of mesmerizing. Um, and so uh, the brown dwarf is, is convective down here. And so the thermal perturbation travels pretty efficiently up through the convective zone. Uh, but uh, in the upper portions of the atmosphere, the only way that energy can be communicated is through radiation, uh, which occurs on slower time scales. And so it actually takes uh, about 100 hours for the thermal pulse that happens down here to make it up to the top of the atmosphere, which means that uh, the top, top of the atmosphere is out of sync uh, with what's occurring in, in the deep atmosphere, um, which is kind of what's been observed for the, 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 the Boinsley et al. brown dwarf, where they had uh, a light curve that was out of sync at, at certain wavelengths. Um, and so if you actually, if you go and you use the model and simulate the spectrum, so given that temperature profile that's varying as a function of time, you can actually create a spectrum of brightness variations. And so these are variations in brightness on this axis, and this is wavelength on this axis through the near infrared. And so as the movie goes on, it's going to be time playing. Um, so you can see that uh, over here at these shorter wavelengths, these are two locations where you can see deep down into the atmosphere. They're on the opposite ends of a, of a water band. And this atmosphere we assume to be cloud free. Um, and so you, these wavelengths you see uh, down to near where the 
uh, thermal perturbation is being introduced. Um, but then at other wavelengths, you don't get to see as deep into the atmosphere. You see higher up. Uh, and so then you get wiggling that is out of sync with the wavelengths where you see deep into the atmosphere, which is similar to what Blainsley et al. Uh, observed. Now the, the complication is, or what came out of this uh, study, is that really the characteristic time scale for driving these thermal perturbations up through the atmosphere of a T-dwarf is more like 100 hours, um, which is longer than the time scales that, ob that uh, variability is currently being observed at. So most people tend to study brown dwarfs over the course of a rotation, which is a couple of hours. So we have lots of data for how brown dwarfs are variable over a couple of hours. We have limited data for how brown dwarfs are variable over, say, 10 hours. Um, and we have almost no information about how brown dwarfs might be variable over, say, uh, 100 hours, um, which is the, the characteristic time scale that kind of came out of this, this study with, between uh, Mark and I. OK, so what about exoplanets? So hopefully you've all been very excited about brown dwarfs because they're just cool and interesting worlds. But uh, I'll do the obligatory uh, exoplanet tie-in because I'm also very interested in, in exoplanets. So I've shown you a lot of brown dwarf spectra over the course of, of, this, um, of this talk. And so here, again, I'm showing you brightness uh, as a function of wavelength uh, for a brown dwarf that's um, kind of in the, the mid-T range. So this is an effective temperature of about 900 Kelvin. Um, I've labeled a lot of the features here. So these are the strong water vapor absorption features that we talked about before, and then the methane also starting to creep in. Um, but what I kind of took for granted while I was going through this talk was exact, or, well, was how uh, high quality these observations are. Signal to noise on these things is very high. You don't see uh, lots of, of, of noise uh, in these spectra. In fact, I don't really have to plot error bars on them because we have such good data for them. Um, let's compare that to the emission spectra that we have for uh, characteristic exoplanets. And so this is HD 189733b. This is the prototype hot Jupiter. Um, and so here I'm showing you brightness ratio to the brightness of its host star. Uh, so this is uh, a measure of the planet's brightness, essentially, um, as a function of wavelength, again, through a portion of the near infrared. Uh, and you can see just how big these error bars are. Uh, you can also see that it's very difficult to spot what are clearly absorption features in, in these observations. Uh, the problem being that it's very difficult to get good data for exoplanets because exoplanets are sitting right next to a really bright star, whereas brown dwarfs can just occur in the field. Uh, and so you don't have to compete with the brightness of a, of a nearby star to get uh, good data for, for the brown dwarf. Um, and so a take home point from that is that brown dwarfs probe uh, a very similar set to atmospheric physics. The uh, temperature here for this uh, hot Jupiter is 1100 Kelvin, which sits within the regime of the temperatures that you get for brown dwarfs. Uh, so the, the physics are uh, common. Um, but for brown dwarfs, you get really high signal noise data, whereas for exoplanets, you don't get high signal noise data. So they're a great laboratory for understanding the kinds of things that you might expect to see for exoplanets or the kinds of processes that are probably happening for exoplanets. Um, and then another point, so this is the, the famous uh, directly imaged exoplanet system uh, around the star HR8799. So HR8799 uh, is more massive than the sun. It's about 1.5 times the mass of the sun. Uh, it is uh, a relatively, well, it's a relatively young star, which means it's formed recently. And so these planets, planets uh, B, C, D, and E, are um, all still hot with their residual energy of, of formation. Um, each of those planets is ballpark about seven times the mass of Jupiter, um, so they're, they're big ones. Um, uh, but recently, observations with the, with the newly commissioned uh, Gemini planet imager um, along with models developed by uh, Mark, and so here we are actually applying uh, Mark's brown dwarf models to exoplanets. So you can actually already start to see the, the exchange between the two. Um, have indicated that at least for uh, planets C and D, uh, that models that include patchy clouds are the best at reproducing the, uh, the, the observations. And so now there's evidence for patchy clouds in the atmospheres of, of exoplanets like these. Um, and so I think it's safe to say, uh, both from our experience in the solar system uh, and from what we're now learning about some of the directly imaged exoplanets, uh, that we're going to see patchy clouds there. And as a result, they're also going to be variable. Uh, and so studying brown dwarf variability is now our leg up uh, to being able to understand exoplanet variability when those observations start to uh, come down the pipeline. OK. So uh, just to, to wrap it up, I want to say a little bit about where this is going to go. I told you that uh, observations of brown dwarf variability are to the point where we're starting to do statistics on them. Um, so those observations are uh, coming along quite nicely. 
Uh, and where kind of the holdup is, is, is in the, the modeling aspect of it. We still don't have a very coherent story that I can tell you about uh, how uh, these uh, variations are being caused, what weather is like on brown dwarves, uh, what might be causing clouds to come and go? Are these things like big convective storms that are forming inside the atmosphere of brown dwarfs? Or are we talking about uh, a world that has a thick cloud cover and maybe just due to uh, advection every now and then you get slightly thicker cloud cover here and slightly thin cloud cover over there? Um, and so there's going to be a lot of work on, on circulation uh, on this uh, in, in the future. Um, uh, and so I showed you work from uh, 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 Xi Jiang and, and Adam Showman and Showman and collaborators have been working on producing the first models of uh, circulation on brown dwarfs. But I told you that those models don't yet have radiation in them. And so to actually be able to tie them back to the observations, that's something that needs to be added. Uh, and so um, fortunately, uh, Showman and uh, Jonathan Fortney and, and Mark Marley have already kind of, at least from the exoplanet perspective, built tools that allow radiation to be um, incorporated into the kinds of simulations that I'm showing you here. Um, so, so there's kind of a clear path forward for being able to get radiation into these and then being able to compare them more directly to the, to the observations. Um, the 3D models that I'm showing you down here don't include clouds. The variability models that I showed you that had the, the snake-like wiggling curves that I like to, to stare at for hours on end, um, those also didn't include clouds. And the problem being that uh, the cloud model that it's kind of universally used or, or widely used in, in the community um, is a steady state model. It's not dynamic. Uh, and so we're, it's clear now that we're seeing evidence for dynamic clouds in these atmospheres. Uh, but our, our preferred tool for studying clouds uh, currently isn't, isn't ready for the, for the task of studying dynamic clouds. And so there's going to be uh, work in, in, the, in the near future, um, and, and this is actually part of my, my next postdoc, is to develop tools uh, to be able to do dynamic clouds uh, in both 1D and in, and in 3D models. Uh, and then, of course, once you have those tools uh, kind of on your, on your tool belt, uh, you'll be ready for when the observations of variability in exoplanets start to come down the pipeline, uh, which I'm guessing is going to be in the next five to 10 years. Uh, and so the timelines there actually sync up pretty well. OK, uh, with that, I want to thank support from uh, NASA and the Oak Ridge Philly Universities and say thank you uh, to everyone for coming. And, and I'm happy to take your questions. All right, we'll take questions. Please wait for the microphone so that people online can hear what you're asking. Thank you. Um, over here. Hi. So uh, are, do you think that the James Webb Space Telescope will be very useful for, uh, since it's like focuses on infrared, on the temperature uh, mappings of brown dwarfs? Uh, so, so James Webb is going to be extremely, extremely useful. I mean, it, it operates at. Uh, exactly the right kind of wavelengths where you need to be uh, to be studying brown dwarfs, and it's uh, it's such a huge aperture, it's such a great light bucket uh, that we're really going to be getting great data for for, for brown dwarfs. Cool. Yep, it's going to be it's a it's going to be a whole new ballpark uh, once we once we have James Webb looking at these things. Can you make a few comments, perhaps, on the relationship between the modeling you're doing of these brown dwarf systems and the weather models for the planet Earth? Um, so no one has uh, attempted to make the, the bridge yet from, from Earth weather models to, to, to brown dwarf uh, circulation models. Um, so the, the 3D simulations that I, that I was showing you are um, by the standards of the general circulation models that we used to say study climate change on Earth um, are, are, are kind of quite primitive. Um, and reason being that it's not exactly a straightforward task to port over the Earth circulation models to the, to the brown dwarf regime. Uh, brown dwarfs don't have surfaces, and the Earth has a surface. Um, very different temperature regimes, which means that the kinds of molecules that are uh, providing absorption or providing opacity are different. The kinds of clouds that are forming are very different. Um, and so the, the approach has been, uh, instead of going through the headache of, of trying to adapt a model that may not be perfectly suited to, to doing brown dwarfs, is to actually build the tools from the ground up and, and start afresh when, when studying the, the brown dwarf circulation, um, which I think is probably the, the right approach. Um, you can tend to get yourself in trouble if you take a Earth ECM and, and take it outside the regime of where it's most comfortable. Uh, every now and then you forget, oh, I forgot to set the rotation rate in this one portion of the code over here. And so that code thought that the planet was rotating at 24 hours. Uh, but actually, I told it that the brown dwarf was rotating at 1.4 hours. And now it's all goofed up. 
Um, so it's, it's probably best to, to start simple and, and add complexity like, uh, like uh, Showman and his colleagues are doing. Tyler, I have sort of a related question while I'm walking over here. A lot of the variability in stars is driven by oscillations rather than rotation. Do you, is that expected in brown dwarfs also? Uh, as far as I know, no. Uh, that it's 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 not going to be an, an oscillation thing. That it's it's going to be it's going to be some kind of weather. It's going to be tied to circulation in, in clouds. Um, kind of a two-part question. I didn't realize that um, brown the L T N Y brown dwarfs were all the same size. I knew the masses were different, but um, any idea what? Causes them to collapse to the same size as a Jupiter size. That's there's the first part. Yep. There's um. Uh, so the I'm not a, a brown dwarf interior person, but the the more physics minded folks who do brown dwarf interiors, there's a uh, it's I believe it's an electron degeneracy. And so it's something similar that's happening with with uh, white dwarfs um, that fixes their size. That also fixes the size of of, uh, of a brown dwarf. Okay. And the second part is. Um, is that also true for um, planets that are two, three, six Jupiter size? Do they, since the brown dwarfs are all the same size, are those also the same size? Uh, yes. Okay. So th things that are in ballpark mass range of, of Jupiter, planets that are in the ballpark mass range of Jupiter, are, are going to have about the same radius of Jupiter. Except, I mean, there are some notable cases. So for the hot Jupiters, um, there, there's a lot of conversation in the literature about them being puffy or bloated, uh, and so there's actually some mechanism that's actually causing them to be larger than, than they should be. Um, but I mean, if you look at Saturn, Saturn size, uh, even though it's it's much more much less massive than than uh, Jupiter, is its size is not dramatically smaller than, than than Jupiter. So yep, that same process operates for the for the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn of the solar system. Uh, the first question, I have two questions. The first is, um, did you present uh, the, like the first half of this in, in a National Geographic magazine? or No. Or Somebody else is, is presenting my work for me then. I'm sorry, what? Somebody else must be presenting my work for me then. <laughs> because I've seen the first half in some magazines. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the, the, what, what I laid out in the beginning is kind of the motivation for why we would want to study brown dwarf variability and, and kind of motivating the models that uh, folks, including myself, have put together is um, the, the motivation is, is pretty universal. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure the arguments of star formation occurring down to very low masses, uh, but the low mass things having interesting chemistry and, and physics, is, it's, a, it's a universal argument. And the second one was that uh, very beautiful simulation you showed at the beginning. Did that include the effects of uh, dark matter? Um, Probably not. And I don't know if the effects of dark matter are, are important at, at those kinds of, of size scales. Yeah, okay. Any more questions? I have, I have one more. Um, Kepler, as part of K2, observed Rho of Eucus in its second campaign. And um, I wonder if there are, are any brown dwarfs that have been identified where you could get light curves, if they're any bright enough invisible. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, okay. so I guess we're going to have to chat about <laughs> okay. whether or not we could dig some brown dwarf variability out of, out of Kepler. That would be exciting. It's a, it's a neat idea. Any other questions? Anybody? Well, let's thank Tyler again. Thank you very much. And we have, as part of our SETI colloquium series, we get the obligatory SETI mug to present to Tyler, if he can drink his coffee or water <laughs> out of now. And uh, thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Cheers.